Latasha Brown, welcome. Thank you. Um, as you know, before I say anything, I am Ajahn, I just want you to know how much I love you. Um, your work, um, not just, um, and I, I think this is something to be learned as well, that she is a part of that community. She comes from that community. And so her experience is rooted in her own experience. And so her value has been shaped by that experience. So of course, um, it would be um, um, perfect for her to kind of lead the vision on this. And so by her brilliance and clarity and passion around this. So thank you, my sister, for who you are. Um, I want to, in, in the, uh, I didn't have a slideshow, but I want to do, I really want to kind of share some thoughts with I think it's some uh, greater pieces of uh, terms of consideration that we need to be thinking about in this moment. We can talk about kind of the movement work uh, from the perspective of kind of the, the technical and the skill approach. Like I can talk to you all about what's the best strategies for organizing. I can really be able to give some of the models or some even the model that, that we have and we'll be willing to answer those um, answer questions related to that um, when we get to Q&A, you know, but what's really on and I'll just say I'm, I'm from the South. So we move, but you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, uh, from the deep South. And so we're okay with moving in what I say by spirit, when my, my mind, spirit and heart are aligned. Um, because I think that there's a greater conversation that is not happening. And, and we're kind of stepping over it. And so I think part of what I really want to kind of for us to think about, and I always do this exercise, but I'm going to ask you all, all who are watching right now, I'm going to ask you if you will um, close your eyes and get grounded wherever you are, just kind of get grounded. And then I want to ask you a question and I want you to kind of clear your mind and listen to the question. What would this nation look like? without racism? What would America be without racism? Now open your eyes. Now I know that's a really big question and we don't have enough time to dev in it. What I will tell you is that no matter where I go, it can I can be at an Ivy League school, I can be in a corporate room, I can be in a community center. When I ask that question, even if, when I give more time for the answer, 98% of the people in the room can't answer that question that that it is very difficult for us to see that racism has become so normalized and such a part of the fabric of how we interact and how we see each other and how we perceive each other that it has become normal yet we continue to say we want to end and address racism and so my next question with to you is and you can keep your eyes open on this one you know, I want you to, matter of fact, I want you to look around the room. I want you to look wherever you're sitting right now, look around the room and just find an object, put an object, whether it's like I'm sitting here, I have an eyeglass case, I have glasses, I have a cell phone, just find an object. Now the objects that you've locked in on, what object do you think was ever created or brought into being that was for, for not first envisioned? nothing. <laughs> Everything that we've seen from this, someone envisioned this before it was actually created, before the mold was created. They had, they had a vision in their mind of this. Someone envisioned what these glasses would look like, right? Before to, there's nothing that is brought into being in the physical world, right? That was not first envisioned. So if we're having a conversation about how we're going to deal with oppression, and if we're having an honest conversation about how we're going to end structural racism, how can we do so when we haven't even envisioned a nation of what it would look like. It is not possible. And so I'm raising this in a context that if we are to create and bring a nation into being that is that is that is not racist, that is not sexist, that actually holds up values of uh, against the oppression of other human life, then the first thing we have to do is really start envisioning, radically reimagining what would every system in this country look like, 
right, that literally was centering around human value. And so part of the reason why I'm saying this is because oftentimes I'm in a lot of conversations around kind of policy, right? I'm in a lot of conversations around programs and approaches. I'm rarely in conversations that we're actually innovation, not in a context of creating a product, right? Innovation, not in the context of figuring out how we can advance capitalism or democracy, but that I desire to be a conversation that is rooted in innovation around how do we literally see ourselves in a human relationship? That how do we see human value? Part of the challenge with um, racism that I just want to raise, that part of what happens in this, in this world is that we've accepted on some level that there are some positive attributes to racism, particularly in the white community, right? What we fail to really understand, right, that while racism in many ways may provide um, some level of privilege, right, to, to those that are in, quote, um, in, the, in the primary race that's lifted up in white supremacy, what we fail to understand is, is that very concept that is the purpose, that is the, the, the actual reason why we are dealing with the erosion of human value across the board. And so it erodes human value for all of us. The reason why we don't help have health care in America right now is not just because you got millions of people that don't want it now. The value was set right post reconstruction, right? When there was a free members bureau wanted to expand health care to newly um, new, new citizens, newly or released enslaved Africans as citizens that there was a, a white cadre of political actors that said, no, 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 no. That wound up setting a value. So now black people, white people, Asian people, um, uh, indigenous people all don't have access to health care because there was an erosion of the thinking around human value that was rooted in an institution of slavery that some all, only thought would affect black people. Yet we are, we've got millions of people currently right now that are dealing with that. I'm saying this because I think we've got to have an honest conversation of how racism destroys our belief around human value for all human life. There is no way to hold this belief that there are some people, the moment that you open up your mind, that there are some people that are not worthy than other people, the moment you open up your mind on that, it actually erodes your belief in human value. The moment that we become okay, that there are children locked in cages because they have a different color passport, or that there are some people who are called aliens as if they're from a different planet. The moment that we open our mind to that theory, we've accepted that there is some erosion of our belief of human value. And so part of my frustration and conversations about policy outcomes. Policy is driven by, and I can even tell you a policy. I can tell you a policy. How within two years, they had literally turned the school around and the school that had been a poor performance school was now a, um, a high performance school. It was on the route of becoming a blue ribbon. And so, and so I'm asking them about, well, what is it that you did? And I didn't hear the things that, that I expected to hear around expectation, shifting expectation, dealing with some of the, the structural pieces. So it made me start wondering, I was like, well, that's strange. How is that the case? Well, you know why? The reason why that was the case, because they created um, a, a, no, uh, a, a policy that basically kicked out the low performing students at the school. And so it gave the appearance as the school was performing higher, when in fact the school was not performing higher at all. What they, they actually kicked out the students that actually created, brought down, quote, the average. I am raising this because there's a way, we all know this, we all know that there's a way that we use data to tell a particular, we can make data tell whatever story we want to, to, to make it take. We can actually use and create a study. They can tell whatever it is we want it to want, want to tell, right? But I think what is really important around the story we have to tell right now is not about how we're moved by being data-driven, data that we're actually moved in a way that 
at the core of everything is around what is our love for humanity? What if the world in every single sector was driven by the love of humanity? How would we interact with each other? What would the field of science look like? What would the field of medicine look like? What would government and politics look like? And so I'm raising this because I can certainly talk about, well, this is what Georgia and XYZ, you know what the magic was of what we did in Georgia? Is we help people remember that they had value. That's it. Everything else, people, uh, how to run a campaign is not changed in a hundred years. <laughs> like the same model for GOTV is the same model everybody uses all over the world, particularly in the US. Like the phone calls and text messages, none of that is new. The changing transformative element was that instead of centering the candidate, instead of centering the political party, we reminded people that they in fact had agency and that they in fact had power and that they in fact had the not only the ability and the right to literally shape anything and everything that governs them in their lives and at the moment in which we should make that transformation that's ajin's work it's not the magic program right even though her programs are great right but we can teach you how to do programs there have been programs forever they're the same way right but the difference is when you are tapping into a greater belief system that human value is centered, it creates a shift in what we see. And so as I, I know I only have um, a minute or two left, you know, as I wrap up, it's because I don't think we're having enough conversations about this. I don't think we're having enough conversations about like the goal and my whole entire life, I've done political work, right? The goal ain't democracy. When I say that people are like, what? No, the goal has never been democracy for me, right? The goal is how do I advance human development? And democracy is a means to an end, not an end in itself for me. So to the extent that democracy of which I, at this moment, in my limited imagination, democracy seems like the best, uh, the best way forward and approach to actually valuing that. And the reason why I make that distinction, because we have actually, as a nation, we've killed people other than names of democracy. We've maimed um, and extracted wealth from people in the name of democracy, as if democracy is actually greater than the people. But how can you have democracy if you don't have any people? And so part of what we have to do is we have to recenter this whole notion of for the love of humanity. And so my politics, my the model of the politics, the model of the organizations that I create the motto of how I'm often constantly even questioning myself. How am I moving in a way? How am I thinking in a way that we can literally see that it is rooted in this idea of for the love of humanity? Because even if I make a mistake, even if I am wrong, I moved in such a way that literally it was seen within the love, the driver was in the love of humanity, not just reducing people to a number or a data point or an outcome that I want. And so um, I'll just wrap up, you know, I wrap up and say, you know, I'm doing three things. One, I'm hoping that people that we can radically reimagine. That first question that I asked, I'm hoping that we will all take some time in our institutions and our conversations to really start envisioning what would this nation, what would America look like without racism. Two, I hope that we will actually use our imagination and our innovative thought, right, to, and innovative thinking to really shape what those systems are needed to actually facilitate that. And three, I hope that we have a conversation that's not just about systems and about how you change the external, but that part of the change, the real change, is how do we reorder people to actually center this notion of human value and that everything is driven from that place. Thank you, Anthony.